Again, thank you for joining our Wednesday demo. Today, we will be talking about EV manufacturing and batteries. Our David Goleminski will be hosting this, and he is from our sales team. Just a little quick uh, reminder, we will be sending out follow-up emails tomorrow morning. So if there's any additional questions that don't get answered today, we can do that as well as tomorrow. And with that, David, take it away. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Adrian. And a uh, matter of housekeeping, it's Golem um, David Golem here, pleasure to be with you today. Um, as Adrian said, I'm one of our senior account executives here on the sales team. I am not a data scientist. I do have a technical background, but I think this speaks to the power and the ease of the Landing Lens platform that we are truly democratizing AI computer vision for everybody. Um, simply put, if I can do it, anybody can. So I'm happy to show you uh, with respect to EV manufacturing, we've got a really interesting data set today from one of our partners, LMI Technologies, of actual EV battery cells. That's what we're going to be inspecting today. Um, I'd like to read a quote before I launch into the demo. Uh, it's from our CEO and founder, Andrew Ng. And this is the quote, instead of focusing on the code, companies should focus on developing systemic engineering practices for improving data in ways that are reliable, efficient, and systematic. In other words, companies need to move from a model-centric approach to a data-centric approach. It's about the data. Um, rather than being model-centric and focusing on the code, we take a data-centric approach here and focus on your data. So the data of interest today, this is a visible light spectra, you know, just a picture from a smartphone of the uh, thing that we're going to be inspecting. These are EV battery cells, again, from our partner, uh, LMI Technologies. So this is what they look like just with a normal camera. As I'll show you in Landing Lens, uh, LMI actually has some special technology where they can image the height of the battery cells and represent it with you know, RGB uh, color. So we end up with a visual representation of the height difference. Simply put, it makes it easier to see defects. So these are the products of interest and we'll spend about 20 minutes. I will save the extra 10 minutes at the end in case you have any questions. Um, I'll also point out some great resources and effectively answer the question, where do we go from here? How do you get started with landing AI? So without further ado, let me jump into the Landing Lens platform. So right now you see uh, the home page inside the Landing Lens platform. Um, you can see some projects I've created in the past. I'll create one from scratch here with this interesting data set in just a moment. If I view the, click on the projects view here, we can see other projects that I've worked on on the platform. We can also go to the examples page uh, to test out some pre-built models, right? If you don't already have some data, or if you just want to test things out, that would be where you can get started. Um, so back to the home page, or right here on the projects view, this visual illustration at the top gives us a pretty great overview of the AI computer vision uh, process, right? How do we create a performative model? Well, the first step is to upload images, as I'll do in just a moment. We're going to go ahead and then label those images. We can draw bounding boxes. We can classify the images as a whole, uh, but we need to label at least 10 instances of a given class or defect or thing that we're interested in analyzing in the picture. Third, we'll hit the train button and actually in the cloud, we'll uh, allocate GPUs and we'll train the AI computer vision model. Finally, we can run inference live in the cloud. I'll also talk about options for deployment uh, that is, you know, performing the inference on the edge in your, say, manufacturing facility rather than in the cloud. So upload, label, train, predict. If I click here where it says create project, we'll see the four different fundamental project types. So from the left, we have object detection. Object detection projects, and this little visual glyph here is kind of helpful. We can draw bounding boxes around the classes or features of interest in an image. And that's how we teach the AI model. This is useful for data sets, say like the 
uh, EV battery cells, here's another visible light image of them, where maybe we, we're interested in specific certain uh, areas inside the image that, that we want to classify as a defect. Segmentation allows us to paint pixel-wise and label defects or classes of interest that way. The advantage to segmentation projects is it can be very precise and exacting, uh, with the caveat of labeling can take a little bit more time, right, since we are labeling pixel-wise and painting on uh, that way. So that's a segmentation project. Third, classification. This is where we can class the image as a whole and account for all the pixels in the image and say, this image represents an OK part, or this image represents a not OK part. Um, so we're classifying the image as a whole with a classification project. Finally, we have a new uh, disruptive tool called visual prompting that allows us to paint only a few pixels, uh, or we'll say, you can detect objects inside of a picture by only painting a, a small you know, label on. It's very powerful. Um, you can see some use case examples if you click load example data. Visual prompting is useful for things like if you wanted to find a dog versus not dog, right? You'd paint some pixels across buddy and then some pixels across the background and you had, you'd have a working buddy the dog detector model. Um, something more practical might be if you're counting bacterial cell colonies in a Petri dish, you can paint only on, say, one of those colonies and then draw another label in the background. And in a matter of about 15 seconds, you'll have a performative AI model. Uh, I won't be demonstrating visual prompting or segmentation with today's data set since, again, use case-wise, these images of the EV battery cells, uh, I found that an object detection approach or a classification approach are actually the, uh, they generate the best, most performative results. So I'll jump in and select an object detection project. We can drag and drop images here to upload them. I'll click on more upload options just so I get this nice big space. And I will dump in this whole folder um, of EV battery cells. There's 179 images. So I'll press upload. And while it's uploading into the platform, into landing lens, I'll tell you a little bit more about this data. Like I said, LMI Technologies, this is their EV battery stack they bought out in, out in the wild. They use their special cameras, their special imaging techniques uh, to acquire this effectively a height map image. Now, most people would work in grayscale. Um, we chose RGB today just because it makes it a little bit more visually interesting and we could perhaps even see the defects a bit more clearly. Um, so it's almost done with the upload here. Um, and again, you see at the top of the screen, the flow, right, for training your first AI computer vision model. First step is to upload, which we just did. Um, the next step is label. And we even get the tooltip when we mouse over it here. Label 10 more images before you can train your first model. So if I click go, it'll take me right into the labeling tool. Now, in this first image, um, you'll see at the tip of my mouse here, I have the ability to create a label. Let me zoom in a bit and label this, this um, we'll call it uh, this proud point. It's standing proud. It's some kind of piece of debris or it's a scratch, right? This is some damage there, right? Because again, we're looking at a height differential map. Um, so I'm just simply going to name this class defect. Okay, and I'll strike the enter key. So there I've applied the first label. I can get a bit more scrutinous and call something like this a defect. Let's keep it to, we'll say, gross defects that we can easily see uh, for the purpose of training this model. So I'll use my arrow key to advance to the next image. And here we see another sort of uh, point that's standing proud in this EV battery cell. So I'll draw another bounding box there. Uh, again, I'm, I'm telling it that inside this uh, bounding box, this represents a defect. Just as I would teach you, a fellow human, hey, here's the the defect or the thing of interest in this picture. On this third image, we don't see any real gross defects in the middle of the cell. So in this case, I'm actually going to click this button in the lower right that says no class to label. So I've just actually taught the model that, okay, in this image, I don't have any defects 
uh, to find. So I'm actually trained, that's part of the training data that I'm giving the model. Um, same thing goes here in this fourth image, no class to label, and so on. So I'll continue through the set. Looks like we've got another uh, defect kind of standing proud right there on this cell. I'll advance to the next. And by the way, um, right now I'm just doing the labeling myself. I can't, one of the uh, advantages to landing lens as a platform, I can assign to my fellow colleagues and subject matter experts, I can assign tasks to complete this labeling. Uh, built into that tool is a consensus driven uh, labeling approach. What that means is if two different, you know, human inspectors label things differently, or maybe the the um, box that they draw is so maybe somebody draws a nice fat bounding box like this, um, and someone else uh, makes a nice tight bounding box, say like this. Um, we can drive consensus amongst the labelers to produce better labeled data, and therefore a better labeled, uh, a better performative model. So I'll continue right along. Let's see how many more we have to go. It says label three more images before you can train your first model. This one looks A-OK. -okay. Here, I'll zoom in and label this part that's standing proud. Nothing to label on this one. And you'll see, it says, well done. You've labeled the first 10 images of this product, project. Since this one has a nice fat gross defect here that we can really clearly see, I will actually label these as well. The more we label, the better the performance of the model, right? Like I said, a minimum of 10 instances is what's required to train a model. But as we'll see in some of the results, by simply labeling from, I think I've labeled maybe six or seven actual defects so far, by doubling that to say 12 to 15 instances, uh, the model performance really does improve. So label just one or two more here. Let's call this a defect and this. All right, so now I'll close the labeling view. I can do that by selecting the Go button here right at the top. And you can see now my next step is to hit the Train button. This is actually going to go ahead and, in the cloud, uh, reserve a GPU, GPU resources, to train the model. And we'll see it converge there. The model training process uh, for this data set, um, it's taken me about a minute and a half, two minutes to do this. Um, we call it the fast and easy when you hit the train button with no advanced settings. So we'll see the performance here and the model converge in just a moment. While that's chugging along and doing its training, by the way, I'll save this as live demo, uh, OD for object detection. So I've saved this project. We can always refer back to that. I'll be jumping back in to check on it here over the couple, next couple of minutes. I previously trained an object detection model just the same way I showed you before, um, where initially I hit that minimum of seven instances of defect. And you can see the model uh, correctly found here in the confusion matrix, seven defects. However, there were seven additional uh, defects that the model did not catch. What's cool about the confusion matrix here, we can jump in and see uh, those individual instances of defects. So if I click on in here, into this one, and you'll see that, uh, oh, this is from the training set. Let me jump into a different one here, this guy. Um, the prediction of the model is um, that there's no defect. So the model called this one uh, good, but it was in fact not good. When I toggle the ground truth here, you can see the bounding box that I had drawn at uh, these coordinates. I had given it ground truth. So this is one of the misses. This would be considered an escape in a manufacturing process. Now, I can uh, rectify this by training additional instances of the defect. And I've actually already done that. Let me turn off the filters and go back to the image view. And over here on the models pane, you can see this was the first model I trained. In the second model, I applied some data augmentations. So this is in the advanced model training page. Um, I also added an eighth instance of defect. And uh, the recall looks a little bit better, but the precision went down. In the third training, I actually just, like I said, I labeled additional. I painted on some more of those um, 
object detection bounding box labels. And you can see the third iteration of this. Um, not only did it find all of the 14 defects that were truly labeled, it found a defect in the ground truth data set that I must have missed. Let's see which one. Let's take a look at this guy. So right here, if we zoom in, I didn't label anything on this. See, it's unlabeled. Um, we can see the model found with 18% uh, certainty this defect at the following coordinates here. Um, so very performative. Uh, total time I spent training these, probably about 30 minutes to iterate and make three different iterations on this model. Now, jumping back um, to the, the model that we created here live, if I jump into the live demo, um, you can see, so this is the model that just finished training. Um, we can see some of the stats here, right? The model converged. We can see the configuration, right? I just hit the train button, 15 epics, like the default settings. Um, and it's pretty performative, 90%, 91% precision and 100% recall. So it found all 10 instances of defect. Um, it did find a defect as well and one that I didn't label. Let's take a look at that. So uh, in the view pane here, if I toggle on and off the bounding box, so the model is 64% certain that this is actually a defect. That's pretty subtle, right? This is one of those edge cases where uh, it's important to go in and look as a human Perhaps our subject matter expert in the EV battery cells could say, ah, that is a defect or no, that is not a defect, but very performative model. And this is the one I trained live for you right here on today's demo. I can save this model. So instead of calling it untitled, I'll call it model one. Model one, default settings. And if I click on the uh, train with custom options here, I can apply some additional augmentations. I can do things like crop in the image um, as well. I can change the number of epics and simply put, I've got a lot of uh, additional uh, tools here if I want to further refine and improve the performance of the model. In general, having again, minimum of 10 labeled defects is gonna give us um, reasonably performative results, I'd say, training additional defects, like if I took the time to label five or 10 more and retrain, I'd have an even more performative computer vision model. Quick time check. We've got about 12 minutes left on today's webinar. Um, let me go ahead and so in the view pane here, we can see again where the model predicted a defect here with 75% certainty. And I did not label this. This is the model finding this defect here, standing proud in the middle of the EV battery cell. If I go back to um, the home page here, so there was the project we created live on today's call. We can see the one I previously created for object detection. Um, the last thing I'll show you here, I'm just being respectful of time, I'll show you a model I already built where I used a classification approach, right? These um, battery cell images here on my hard drive were set in two different folders, bad and good. And so I used that uh, to actually apply labels to these images as I uploaded them. So when I uploaded them from the good and bad folders, Landing Lens recognized that and said, oh, this came from the good folder. We'll apply the label good. Um, reasonably performative here too with the first model, 90.5% precision and recall. We can see the correct predictions it made. There were 86 good, 76 bad. And we also see where we had some uh, um, incorrect predictions where the ground truth was good and the model called it bad, right? That's a false call. Here, ground truth bad and the prediction was good. That's an escape. Um, and we can go in and look at those edge cases and perhaps even reclassify them and train again. Um, if I jump in here and look at this one, the ground truth on this image is bad. We can actually see a defect right here, it looks like. Um, but the prediction was this is a good image. Let's see which pixels influenced that. This is a pretty cool feature in classification projects. So when I toggle this view, you can see these pixels here did influence the model's decision. I can actually toggle that as a whole on the data set, and we can see what pixels influence. So when I toggle, that might be subtle to see right now. 
you can see it's all those pixels in the middle of each of these EV battery cells that's influencing it. Well, right now we're at the 20 minute mark. I hope you appreciate this intro to landing lens. Um, at this time, I'm actually going to ask Adrian, um, are there any questions that I can address on today's call? Yes, great. Thank you, David, for a great presentation. And we do have a question. And that question is, what are minimum data that would be needed? Yeah, so the minimum amount of data that's needed, I, I've said this uh, previously when I was doing the labeling, but it's 10 instances of a given class, you know, a given defect or object of interest in that image. So once you've labeled a minimum, and again, this is minimum we're talking, 10 instances of a given class or defect, we can train an AI computer vision model. We'd recommend more than that, but that's the minimum. And you saw me do it here in the demo where I labeled approximately 10, maybe 14 uh, instances for that object detection demo. And uh, you know, we saw a pretty performative model, even at a first, you know, you saw me do it here in just a few minutes. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, one other thing I'd like to touch on in the spirit of answering questions in general, maybe a pro tip. Um, I talked about like the home view here in the platform, the projects view. I would like to call out the Landing AI community as a great resource. Uh, if you have questions, looking for guidance, um, lots of great technical folks on here. Um, you know, please feel free to post questions there in the Landing AI community. The other thing I, uh, I'd like to show you here, this little question mark button takes us to the support center. And I find myself citing examples from this uh, probably a few times every single day for customers. This getting started resource is quite helpful. If we wanted to deploy, besides deploying in the cloud, if we wanted to deploy on the edge, you can see an overview of landing edge here as well. This is our answer for on-prem, as well as connectivity to your uh, industrial controls schema. So I know I over answered that question there, Adrian, but thank you for asking it. What other questions are there from the, the folks on the call? We also have a question. Can you talk a little bit more about uploading pre-labeled images? We have a 60 defect codes to classify and I have code written in the name of each image. Oh, interesting. So uh, I'll answer it with pictures here. If I go back into the platform and create a new project. So if you've got pre-labeled images, uh, don't quote me on this. I think it's JSON format is what we support for pre-labeled images. If you've got that in the metadata, I believe it's JSON uh, is what we would support for object detection. So if you've got them labeled with bounding boxes, that would be the approach. If you've got them classified, like so here, if I go and select a new classification project, you can pick from unclassified images, which are, you know, the data is not structured in any way on disk. They're, they're all just random files, and we'd have to go through and label them in landing lens. If I've already got them classified into folders, I can select classified images. And this is where, again, if I have a bad folder and a good folder, you'll see it ingests from those folders. These 84 instances of battery cells that are bad and 95 that are good. And if I hit the upload button, you'll see it'll do its thing here and pull them into uh, landing lens. No problem that I think the question you said there were uh, 50 different classes of defect or classes in general in the image. Um, you may find that uh, one approach would be separate models for different types of defects, right? You can run model after model after model, perhaps an approach of a one size fits all or one big model to do everything might not be the best approach. Rather, you can, I've got a customer doing this today where they use a um, classification model to identify something particular in the image. And after that, then it runs one of three different object detection models. Um, so you can programmatically stitch them together to meet your use case. We welcome a discussion about that uh, too, but I'll pause. Hopefully that answered the question and provided some insight for, uh, for whoever asked it. Thank you for the question. What else, Adrian?
I guess I can pre preemptively answer a question I get asked often on the sales team here at Landing AI, and that is, how do I get started? Like, where do I begin? Um, you may or may not be aware that right on our homepage, landing.ai, there's a button here in the upper right, start for free. Anyone and everyone can go on and create a uh, free trial of Landing Lens to test it out with your own data. That's a great starting point. Of course, we welcome a conversation with you. You can hit this contact us button or use you know the, the community. We're here to help. Um, our pre-sales team is fantastic in terms of assessing what's possible. But in general, some pro tips would be uh, good use cases are use cases where you already have cameras or images available. That's probably the biggest non-starter to computer vision projects, right? It's perhaps a new model of an EV that hasn't been built before, right? Maybe you have some synthetic data that you've simulated defects, right? Because you're not yet at full volume manufacturing. That's fine. We can train on those, but we need images as kind of step zero. Once you have images, once again, I encourage you to take advantage of the free trial. And of course, feel free to reach out to us for support. Four minutes left here. What other questions are there, Adrian? You're muted in the Zoom. Hold on, sorry about that. Um, let me repeat that question. If you need to only label 10 images, why should we upload 100 plus images? Ah, great question. So one thing I didn't explain uh, is that by default, Landing Lens splits the data into different sets. So if I go in here, we go to one that's been trained. We'll do the one we created together here, the live demo object detection. If I go to this filter, you can see the different data split. So these 179 images that I uploaded were split into different sets for training, dev, test, and unassigned. You can manually assign images to a given split. Um, but simply put, uh, yeah, I could have just uploaded 10 images, and that would have been enough. But what's really cool is seeing the performance on unlabeled. So notice after about, what is this? Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, four. I've only labeled 13 of these images. And then notice this tag here, unlabeled. These are images that were not used um, to train the model. So this one, the split was unassigned. If I go to the view tab, you can see the AI model ran inference on it and it detected defects at these two locations with 37% certainty and 67%. So that's why you'd upload more than the bare minimum is you can run inference on these uh, to test the performance of the model. I can also go down to the deploy page here and uh, create an endpoint. And what this will allow me to do is run inference here in the cloud um, with this model that we, that we trained with the default settings. We'll come back to that in a moment once it's done uh, spinning up the instance. But hopefully that answered the question. That's why you'd upload more than the bare minimum is you want to test additional images and see the performance of the model. Let's see if it deployed. And I know it is deployed for my other object detection that I created previously. So I can hit the predict button here. And then I can either drag and drop, or I could even programmatically uh, interact with this, but I'll grab one of these cell images at random, drop it here. It's uploading and it's inferencing. Wow, that was pretty, pretty fast there. The prediction is no labels, meaning it didn't find any defects on this image. Let's take another one here at random and see what the inference is like. Another one, no label. Let me take one that might have some defects on it from the bad folder, see what it does. Yeah, we're almost at time here, folks, but uh, hopefully you get the idea and hopefully that's helpful in, in seeing it here in the, in the platform. And we have one last question when you're ready. Yeah, go for it. And this one has to do with deployment. <clears throat> Landing Edge doesn't work on iOS. Second part of that question is for the commercial use for real time on assembly line, how would you deploy? Yeah, for real time on an assembly line, I mean, Landing Edge is our solution used by manufacturers 
it's also used for use cases. Um, I've got a client where their use case dictates uh, low or no internet connectivity out in the field where their big machines operate, but they need this to be doing inference there locally. So what we're doing with them, they use landing lens to train the model in the cloud and then landing edge to deploy. Um, so landing edge is software from us. It's true, it does not run on iOS, right? You see I'm on my MacBook here, but it's uh, supported by Windows and Linux. We just released Linux support uh, as well. Now, again, in the cloud inference and landing lens, the GPUs are in the cloud. You don't need to invest in any hardware. With landing edge, we'll need to provide that edge compute hardware to do the inferencing. Um, I see we're a minute over here. Hopefully that answered the question. Happy to go in depth on any questions you have. And as well, Adrian's gonna send out a follow-up email after this webinar. Any other questions here before we part ways today? We are good, David. Fantastic. Well, I thank you all for your time. Feel free to reach out. Again, there's several ways to reach Landing AI. The community, right there on our homepage, you can sign up for a free trial or hit that contact us button um, and we're happy to help. So thank you and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Take care. Thank you for joining us. Just a little closing housekeeping. We will be sending out follow-up emails tomorrow. You do have my email address in the chat. So if you'd like to talk to us um, sometime today, feel free to drop me an email and we will have this recorded session attached to the email. Thank you again. We do this every uh, other Wednesday, and we do have a series of new webinars coming up um, for the summer, and it will be around camera and physical settings. Um, it'll be a master series, and um, we always encourage demo topics. So if you join our community, we do post a lot there, so feel free to drop um, what you would like to see, but we do have a schedule of, so, demo topics we'll be discussing this summer. Um, again, thank you for your time. Look for those follow-up emails tomorrow morning. And again, if you need to talk to us earlier, feel free to drop me an email. Thank you. Have a great day.